ladies and gentlemen. You may have climbed Kilimanjaro. You may have climbed Everest. But have you climbed Mount Narodnaya? Probably not. Unless you've been to Russia. Let's listen into the backstory. Nineteen forty five to nineteen seventy five. Japan Soviet relationships are poisoned by the Soviet occupation of the Kuril Islands. Hence, the two countries have not been able to ratify a formal peace treaty since the end of World War II. 1979 to 1980, the Soviet Union increases troops and naval assets in the Kuril area. Japan retaliates by hardening its stance towards the USSR and increasing its military spending. 1982, Japan allows the deployment of US advanced F-16 bombers on its soil. The USSR answers by transferring SS-20 missiles from Europe. 1983, the Japanese Prime Minister declares his intent to turn Japan into an unsinkable aircraft carrier. The reply from the USSR is immediate. In an era of modern technology, unsinkable aircraft carriers do not exist. November 1984. The joint U.S.-Japanese naval exercise Fleet X-85 in the Sea of Japan gets as close as 500 nautical miles from Vladivostok. The Soviet fleet is put on high alert. December 4, 1984. Fleet X ends, but Soviet Navy intelligence and the Politburo are convinced that it was just a rehearsal for a real imminent strike. The green light is given for a preemptive strike on Japan and its U.S. naval bases. December 6th, 1984. When the coded message, Climb Mount Norodnaya, is transmitted to Soviet forces, several airborne and naval infantry divisions are ready to strike Japan. At dawn, the first wave of Soviet paratroopers lands on Japan, while a mechanized thrust strikes from the Kuril Islands. Comrade. Our amphibious and airborne operation in Japan is a success, and Tokyo is about to fall. Now it's up to you to secure our western flank. Your aim is to protect Osaka while neutralizing at least three enemy airports, but beware the Americans will launch a powerful counterattack in your sector. Colonel Borodin, carry on with the briefing. Thank you, General. Our first wave is made up of parachute and marine infantry units supported by the aircraft carrier Minsk. Our marines can land in four sectors to the north and west. Then we will have to capture harbors and airports in order to route our heavy reinforcements. The Kunitsov Naval Group will support us from the southeast. It can transport combat airplanes, offensive helicopters, and marine or helicopter-borne infantry battalions. One last thing, comrade. Beware the enemy pocket around Gobo Airport. Their counterattacks can threaten Osaka if you're not careful. Understood. You have 16 days to achieve your goals, to control at least three airports, even four or five if possible. Don't disappoint us. Yes, sir. Welcome back. I think if you're here, you know why you're here, but let's recap. This is War Game Red Dragon, the fourth campaign called Climb Mount Narodnaya. Let's read this. Major, I can confirm Knetsov has arrived. Marine or helicopter battalions are available. We should lose helicopter-borne troops for inland assaults. Marines could land in Nankuko with air or ground support. Beware, however, the enemy has a strong presence in this area. So in this campaign, the climb Mount Narodnaya, you're trying to complete the conquest of Japan. The narrator told you that they've conquered northern Japan, and you just have to conquer the rest. However, the Americans are about to show up, and they have better hardware. So the smart man, the smart Russian, would fight now 
and win before the Americans arrived. And uh, that's what I intend to do in this particular campaign. You start with 40 points, and the coon itself costs 20. So half of your starting points go just to get this helicopter supply ship into the battle. But with the first helicopter, you're able to take that five-point sector, and thus you'll get five more points next turn. It's one of the only points you can gain this turn. Up north, I concentrate my two Marines together, prepared for a dual landing at Obama, though it is a staggered landing, as we've seen in previous campaigns, so that I can attack two sectors on one turn. With Totori being secured by the Marines and two other Gobo and Kanoya by helicopters, it falls to the Vedaved, the VDV here, these airborne troops to take Nagasaki and Hiroshima airports. That'll be the fourth and fifth. To win this speedrun challenge, I have to get all five airports in under four turns. Since we start at turn zero, that means turn three would be the latest, but I'd consider this scenario a win. Major, we're inside of the first objective. The airfield is intact but well defended. We're awaiting your orders. Hiroshima here is probably the lightest defended, so all it gets is some air cover from that northern carrier and one airborne brigade. In this series, I'll generally be fighting the tougher battles first, so that if they end up being too tough, I can restart the series without too much lost time. In the case of this campaign, it's probably the one that I play tested the most and played myself before starting to record this series, just because it's the first really challenging of the campaigns. The two very hard campaigns, fourth and fifth campaigns, are really the ones that are fun to play once you get good at the game. And these battles where you only bring one brigade are some of the toughest, especially if you're needing a total victory or a victory where you annihilate your opponents. You can in some cases get a major victory, but still essentially get a total victory because you've annihilated the enemy unit and will take possession of the sector anyway. Here though, I have very limited units and I either need to get a technical total victory through one of the other methods, or just take so few losses that I get the more common total victory of wiping their command points while suffering less than 30% losses on my own. And if I start with less than a thousand points like I do, that means that my cap is under 300 points, so I'll be trying to lose less than 200, although it can be hard to keep track of that during the battle. And plenty of these battles I end up not getting the total victory, and those have been cut out for the YouTube version. I did try to leave the loading screen so that you would know, at least, that there were some attempts being cut out. Here I've got a mixed force headed for this group of buildings in between my starting sector and the sector I'm moving to assault. I can basically bring in my entire force. Plamas aren't very good against vehicles, but they're excellent against troops, in addition to being recon. So I try to have them near my own troops so they can assist. Beyond that, I only have the two command units. One's going to move forward and capture, one's going to stay behind and continue to hold this, hopefully draw a counterattack. The biggest enemy force here 
is even though the American counter-tank hasn't begun, there are some American units present in Japan. And there are some Super Cobras, the 100-point helicopters, with both excellent anti-infantry and anti-vehicle capabilities. The only thing I have that can take them are the Shreket transports there and the AA infantry that they're carrying. And this unit only gets two of those. The reason that they're chosen is because the other para, para unit, airborne unit that I start with has even less AA than that. There's some specialized anti-infantry, or I'm sorry, anti-air airborne brigades, but I'd have had to buy them and to get off to a fast start in this campaign, it's crucial that you purchase the Kunitsov and that particular helicopter unit, or at least one helicopter unit that can capture that five point province and thus increase the maximum you have to spend in the first two crucial turns. You can see I do get my Iglas into the building just in time. Their transport's taken out by the Super Cobras, but the Igla in range will eventually shoot down the Super Cobras, and you can see they're trying to drift out of range. My other anti-air infantry has got that singular Super Cobra at close range, and we'll destroy it pretty quickly. They managed to intercept me with some of the Super Cobras, but once I can deal with them, there won't be too much left on the ground that can do a lot of damage. See the 100 points there, that's one of the Super Cobras going down in the northern part by the coast. Some kind of big explosion is either my uh, supplies or it's heavy artillery coming in. I managed to get enough infantry forward and also the robots have anti-tank rockets, guided missiles rather. And those will one-shot these weak APCs that the Japanese troops are using in this battle. In most cases, they'll use the five-point transports for both good and bad troops. So intercepting them is very key in making sure that you don't take too many losses. So we've got those artillery pieces out in the open. Pretty expensive, so those are probably pretty heavy caliber. 60 point isn't the most expensive. We've destroyed 120 point artillery in other campaigns. But it's definitely not short range because those artillery pieces will only cost 30 or 40 tops. Shortest range mortars are very cheap. More Super Cobras supported by infantry and APC are trying to take this small town and probably will succeed. Decided to try to get the recon out of there because they have very little combat power. If they're engaged at all, they'll be killed. Probably five to ten seconds later, assuming that it's not just by a single unit. One of the nice things they do have is that sniper round. If you can keep them at long range to an infantry, that sniper rifle will actually do pretty good damage to infantry. Something to keep in mind when you're building your deck or uh, facing an opponent with this type of force. And definitely something to keep in mind when you're playing this campaign and trying to get the best use out of this particular infantry and their recons. Of 
crossing that short, probably less than a kilometer gap has cost a lot of men, but once you get there, you can follow the buildings into their captured sector. And it's just one more gap to take it out completely. However, because of my uh, aerial landing, dropping paratroopers is much like helicopters. You'll capture a central sector rather than a peripheral sector. So your first order of business is to capture that peripheral sector, get some reinforcements in. Assuming you couldn't bring in everything, and in this case it was a big enough unit that I do have some reserves I'll be bringing in once I capture this, if I can capture this sector. But, uh, yeah, spoiler alert, I do, I do win this battle. If you were paying attention, I gave it away when I said that, uh, I edited this for YouTube. It's just the, it's just the wins now. This video and most of these challenges have been cut in half. The time it takes, the, the length of the video from the Twitch version has been cut in half by the editing out of the failures. So, as long as it is at a little over two hours, it uh, could have been worse. My uh, stealth fails my command unit here, and I actually lose him. Which is a unforgivable loss. Most times in your first mission, if you lose your command, you should just restart. But for some reason, I decided to keep going. Other than that, this mission's been pretty, pretty good. If I can keep it under about 250 in losses, I can still come out. 250 or 300. So with the helicopters cleared... And my men furious at the loss of their commander, I order a all-out assault with everything, except for a small group of units that'll hold those buildings, hold the back line, essentially. What I really need is to get some supply units to the infantry and start restoring their numbers. The command unit in the back decides that he needs to risk himself. This battle can't be won without some reinforcements being brought in. Let's see the heavy craters all around. Though I took out the artillery in close range, they have multiple reinforcement points. You see the artillery is falling from their southernmost sector. They'll smoke an area that they intend to assault or want to blind. In other cases, they're calling in the high explosive to try to take out men and material. These self propelled artillery are making a break for it. My advance is a little too slow to catch up to them, so some of them might just make it away. To keep up to them, you have to move fast on the roads, but when you move fast on the roads, you're, that, you're very likely to be ambushed by infantry, in this case also by helicopters. The Japanese force starts with a brigade of helicopters that includes the eight Super Cobras. I've taken out maybe four so far, so until I count that I've taken out the full eight, my advances will be pretty slow, and I'll try to keep an AA infantry nearby. I lost one of my AA vehicles, but I still have one of those, and so it'll probably be stationed between the two. It's faster, so it'll move to respond whichever side the helicopters show up on. I do catch that 60-point artillery on the road 
before it can quite get away, probably with a guided missile from the robot. I also managed to intercept some uh, anti-tank troops with infantry, which means that they are quickly killed, taken off the board. My infantry up north holds the RPGs and the machine guns eventually defeating the APCs and probably driving off the helicopter since they can't see the infantry anymore. My robots, machine guns can't penetrate the armor of these self-propelled artillery, so I'm bringing in my... These aren't even really tanks, but you can call them light tanks. The ASUs. Their cannons are capable of penetrating the armor. So I finish off the artillery in this zone. And start to bring the computer to a point total where I can see victory within my grasp. I've still got to minimize my losses, get a total victory, or kill the right units, drive my enemy away. Got enough points to bring in just about anything I could want, but the infantry I've already brought in once it's been resupplied will be perfect for a spearhead so I intend to mainly bring in supplies so as not to risk too many units to be lost infantry can be the best to both defend and assault with because assuming they're not wiped out they'll be replenished between missions vehicles if destroyed can often cost that unit its numbers until it gets a chance to refit at a port or other location where refit is available in these games. You can see their artillery gets a kill. They have some kind of spotter in the area. I need my own recons to better find it. If you don't have recon, the best thing you can do is just keep it keep your units moving and enough supply nearby that is well hidden to repair them. So far we've taken a couple hundred, maybe 300 points of losses, so the total victory might be out of reach. We'll have to see here what happens. Artillery is still coming in from the southern sector, but we're finally out of its way. We know there's a command unit in Dimitri. If we can get that, we can end the mission very quickly. Yep, that sound means you're taking damage, and if you look in the center, any kills you take will be listed. It's going to be hard to keep track of that in the midst of battle. The helicopters were just lurking behind the forest waiting to strike. Their ATGMs are very accurate and with extraordinary armor power will insta-kill anything but tanks and even heavy tanks can only survive a few at best unless maybe they catch them all on the front armor. You can see that they have more than 60% accuracy so when two Super Cobras fire the rockets at the same target it's almost guaranteed to be destroyed. I'm worried that recon loss pushes my losses just as I was about to get to Dimitri and potentially win the Super Cobras come in and do terrible terrible damage it's the danger of leading with vehicles in the open anything can ambush you from the trees and some of the best ambush units out there are these super choppers, 100 point plus choppers. Super Cobra is the first 
opponent we've faced that is a chopper and is that high of a value. So three or four of them can pretty much one-handedly wipe your whole army if you mass them up in column and let them get caught on the road. Have the rockets stun everything. The missiles take out all the vehicles, and then the machine gun finishes off the infantry. It's really a very, very deadly piece of hardware. You have to respect any helicopter that is 80 or 90 points plus in this game. And even the 30, 40 point ones can be deadly when they catch something without air cover. my safe assault finally whittles away enough enemy and like I said I didn't get the total victory but I managed to kill enough of the right units that each unit was broken and destroyed and thus I will claim possession of this province despite taking more losses than I would have liked 540 is far too much you really want to keep it under 2-300 but against super cobras it's no small feat. So I'm just happy to happy enough to get the win. I'll worry about how few forces earn the Spetsnaz unit there later. Gives us the chance now to focus on Hiroshima. Which though might look like it has a stronger force, actually is a bit weaker than what we just fought, because there's no world beating super cobras. The closest things are those shaky E's. Very nice tank, but I've got anti-tank in this brigade, so, so if I manage well enough, I can counter them before they do a lot of damage. Once again, though, the difficulty of these airborne landings, you start without a reinforcement sector. So the early part of this will be all about taking control of the nearest peripheral sector and then bringing in enough reinforcements to continue the assault in time to get a total victory. Although given that we start this battle in the first turn, we don't necessarily need a total victory. There's no reason not to get one. And since this is an airfield, any plane stationed here will be cleaned, will be cleared rather, and taken off the board for all my future missions. So this is why airfields are assaulted in the first are assaulted and or bombed on the first days of any war. Because A you want your planes there and B you don't want their planes there. So probably not too hard to understand, but let's make that clear in case anyone was wondering what the purpose of this campaign demonstrates. Essentially they've already conquered Japan but they want to secure it from counterattack from the Americans, which would happen. And the way to do that is to capture every remaining airfield in the country. Given the year that this is set, you get most of, if not all, of the units available in this game that you can use. And so whereas most of the other campaigns were set in the 70s or early 80s. Now we have full access to Soviet hardware, but that means we're also facing the 90s plus NATO hardware. The damage will come quicker, our vehicles will be insta-shot more often, and we'll have to rely on air power much more because that rules the day in the 90s much more so than the 80s. Given that I know these buildings and forests must still be clear, I'm moving fast through the road, past them, and in some cases using them as cover, detaching a few units to go around and attack from the south side of this forest, while the rest are moving along the road and will do their best to capture this group of buildings that the Japanese Hueys are landing infantry at 
so they quite wisely are making it very difficult for me to take control of a sector where I can bring in reinforcements. If you've watched previous campaigns, you've seen me do this to the AI where I isolate them in a central province where they can't bring reinforcements and just hold the defensive line and defeat them through attrition rather than having to mount a more complicated and dangerous assault on their sectors. I only do so at the very end of their attack when I've depleted their starting force. Here's one of the few instances where I use smoke. I don't want them to be able to see the force assaulting across the road. So the buildings block anything behind the buildings and the smoke blocks anything in the buildings. While my light tanks, we'll call them the ASUs, and then the APCs and infantry make their move. I know that they have some tanks nearby from previous attempts at this map. And, and so I am very wary of getting APCs with the troops still in them hit by cannon fire. That's why I've dismounted some of the men as I move forward. Even though that means they uh, won't participate in the battle for the most part as they're so much slower than the APCs. Foot speed slower than vehicle speed for a while now. Here comes, here comes the pain. It's the other reason to take this sector so that they can no longer call in these airstrikes. Two devastating bombs fall and I take about as many losses from those bombs as I've dealt with my successful assault. But fortunately, didn't catch the command unit. Here comes another bomb. Don't know how much pain it'll do, but it's also not targeted at that command unit, fortunately. But you can see the amount of pain that bombers can do. That's why I assigned a unit of fighters of the Yak type from my carrier. However, I need this sector cleared of the enemy command unit and mine present before I can bring in that fighter unit. They'll be rearming for about a minute now and it's so crucial that I capture the sector before they can rearm that I'm still going very slow on the speed which is something I try to avoid for this series. But you've just got to, got to record at this very slow speed when you're going this hard, this try hard to not take losses and avoid the tanks that are lurking and bring in your planes and avoid the bombers. So if the spread of my units was enough that those bombs didn't wipe out my assault, but I took enough losses that the total victory is in doubt if I take significantly more. This unit, however, does have a lot more leeway than the Spetsnaz Brigade that was fighting in the first fight, the first battle we've seen in this video. I find the tanks the hard way. My reinforcements are caught in the open by the only eight awesome tanks my opponent has. These are about 60 point tanks, whereas the other tanks are about 40 point tanks. I don't have any guided missiles present to bring in or to bring in. So the best thing I have to take them out and not take any counter damage is actually the Yaks themselves. Given that my opponent's air is bombers and not fighters, I can feel pretty safe that I can machine gun the tanks and not have the enemy fighters sneak up on me and shoot me down. While they do have anti-air weaponry, they're not good enough to threaten my yaks, which are actually primo 140 point air superiority fighters. The fact that they're shooting at these tanks is actually doing a teeny tiny amount of damage, but it will add up 
and the speed of the planes means that I can keep them moving, keep them attacking, and as I machine gun them, they'll take more and more damage, they'll become more and more separated. The problem I suddenly find is that with no troops near enough to the tanks, I can't identify them to bring in the planes to target them. So I begin to maneuver to bring some eyeballs onto those tanks, knowing that if I don't, those eight tanks could probably clear that force I have holding this sector, and then some. They might not lose a single tank doing it if I have bad, bad control of my units. The quote-unquote tanks that I have, the ASUs, have no armor and no armor penetration power compared to these opponent tanks they're facing. However, I know that as bad as I might get beaten in score, if I can kill all the command units, I can sneak out a total victory. So I've redirected my fighters to attack their command vehicle, which because it's, it's uh, on the retreat, I can see. The tanks are attack moving through the field rather than moving fast through the road. That's why they're A, harder to see, and B, moving much, much slower than the command unit. They also presumably have a lower top speed to begin with. The Shiki E's are medium to heavy tanks. The other ones are medium or medium light. Similar, similar looking, similar size, but they don't pack nearly as much punch, don't have as much armor. You see how badly their tanks wipe out my tanks. These are actually from the vehicle department. So anytime you're bringing anything in from vehicle or support, don't expect it to stand up to anything that can call itself a tank. Now that I can spot these tanks, aircraft are again brought in to attack them, and I realize that the artillery can at least stun them and make them less able to do damage to me. But three or, or two out of three of my tank units have been wiped out. The one that came around from the side and had a decent angle is actually getting good cannon shots, and with the stun of the artillery, and the machine guns from the air contributing, I get my first kill. One of eight of their super tanks down, and 13 and a half minutes remaining. Try to get this victory. He's either randomly or very intelligently staying just out of RPG range, but he wanders a little bit too close, finally. And I'm able to move in and get the kill. You can see now that these are the 50 point tanks. Whereas I think my uh, ASUs are 15. So, really, point wise, I should have 4 to 1 numbers before I even try to take them out. And effectively, if you're coming at them head on, those type of tanks could probably take 40 or 50 ASUs before they lost a single unit because their frontal armor is so superior to the cannon. The issue would have to get in very close range to even do the damage, and by that point, it's been blown away, as its frontal armor is virtually nil compared to the damage that a heavy, t heavy or medium tank cannon does. If you're not familiar, the range of the AP some of the APCs will have a half point or one point of armor piercing. Really good APCs and vehicles can have as much as 8, 10, 12 AP. But then the light, that's the level of a light tank, about probably 10 or 12. Medium tanks are going up to 15. Then a heavy to super heavy range would be about 20 AP to 25 AP. The uh, super tanks, the 90s and the super Abrams types they'll have about 26-ish from memory. I never paid extra, extra close attention to the stats. But I do remember that much. In 
finally able to bring in some infantry close enough. And infantry is one of the more effective things I have here. It's already taken out too, although these tanks do a lot of damage right back to the infantry. It costs me one infantry for the four tanks. But we saw my first three infantry get, that I tried to bring in get wiped out by those eight tanks. So infantry out in the open will get wiped out by tanks. Tanks caught in close quarters with infantry, as long as they're not uh, garrison infantry with really bad RPGs, that infantry will take out the tanks. Some of your uh, weakest infantry with older models of RPGs can't do much damage, and even in a city, the tank has a good chance of killing them. In those cases, you want to make sure that you maneuver the infantry around the sides or even the rear of the tank so the RPG actually has a chance of doing real damage. Trying to do something that's hard to do, remounting my troops and then making a mechanized assault on Boris. If I run into more tanks, these APCs and infantry are going to have a bad day. So I'm trying to front this with my recon so I can take cover in time if I do see tanks on the horizon. With the eight tanks that they start with taken out of their starting sector, I can finally go in. See one of my uh, mobile units actually gets caught by something that I'd forgotten about, the bombers. And I remember that I have really, really good fighters, and I should probably be uh, covering my advance with those fighters. Next time, next time NATO shows up to bomb me, I'm gonna have a bad day. Or this is Japan, so maybe not technically NATO, but yeah, the next time my enemy shows up, these yaks have uh, AA missiles with about seven mile range. Seven kilometer, rather. I keep uh, going to English measurements because I am here in America, but uh, trying to get more metric minded as this game is an EU game and all of its numbers are in meters. Finally, see the column of enemy tanks, and we're caught out a bit in the open. The cheeky C's are almost as good as the E's, so nothing, nothing to scoff at. 40 points versus 50, and there's a lot more of them. So I have to be very careful that they don't overwhelm me. There that was covering now goes to the attack, machine gunning the tanks from, from on high. Their strafing runs, very unlikely to kill the tanks but certainly scaring them and eventually eventually they'll knock them out of commission Five yaks is a pretty powerful force. See a bunch of choppers hiding on the perimeter here, trying to escape notice. The longest range missiles can't target the helicopters, but air superiority fighters carry both the long and short range missiles. And so those short range missiles, pretty accurate and very good damage against helicopters. 
down here in the town my bit of bed managing to hold on they're taking the kind of losses that uh, will mean that they won't be effective till they get reinforced through supply units got to check on the sound be right back finish checking just a small issue with the video not with my headset or any of the recording so continuing on the sound will be back soon the bit of bed is going after this CBC and it's gonna win but it's a question of if he can catch me and knock me out one of my guys was out of rockets so I combine them up the second squad hands over a couple of RPGs to the first squad and they both get together and destroy that tank. Teamwork makes the dream work folks just further proof right there. My KPV recon here are very delicate so they've been staying back but uh, now that I've taken out the tanks they'll be moving forward trying to identify and destroy the command unit that must be in Boris wouldn't be blue if there weren't a command unit stationary there so there's at least one the fact that it just twitched there means I'm making him nervous the artillery may well be falling right on top of him if he's stunned he will not be able to capture a sector so keep that in mind you can often find command units by artillery in a sector and seeing where it might uh, where the where you're hitting when the blue flickers to gray keep in mind that if your opponent's smart they can just slightly move then stop their command unit to create that effect and trick you into thinking that their command unit is in a particular area but uh, it doesn't mean they, they'll always be thinking that way and of course they can't fake it when it is stunned sneaking your recon units around the map and sniffing out enemy recon units and then destroying them is one of the more advanced concepts in this game. I'm not as great at this game as I am at the campaign in general because I've played it so many times. I do enjoy multiplayer but it's a very different animal than the campaign. Just to uh, hang out in the forums for a little while and uh, yeah, you'll see the single player multiplayer just slightly different in this game but still the multiplayer I think gets all the attention but the single player especially this campaign is one of the gems of all gaming this is in my mind the uh, modern warfare equivalent of some of the best total war games we've ever seen some of those campaigns like uh, Napoleon also enjoyed back in the day those kind of dated Empire Total War so I was trying to finish off this sector another group of tanks show up from Elena heading towards Boris. Luckily I managed to get the infantry into the buildings rather than having them caught open on the road another 10-20 seconds those tank cannons would have been in range. See my KPV recon living life on the edge and pays for it. Yep, that shows you the range of those tank cannons, or maybe maybe more like their spotting range. They might actually be a bit longer range than that, but with no recon nearby, they're limited to what they can see as to what they can shoot. And that's why they don't notice my infantry until the rockets start flying out at them. I get the first strike, 
but seven tank cannons and seven machine guns do a lot of damage. And my 40 infantry are shredded. Shredded down to five now at this point. Down to three. So, uh, in gaming, we call what just happened to that infantry being insta -gibbed. Don't let that happen to your men. It's not pretty. However, they did hold the tanks in the open and are now allowing my other infantry in. So by flanking these guys, putting the RPGs into their side armor, I've started doing more damage and I've already been softened up by the machine gun fire of these fighter aircraft. Keep in mind, these fighter aircraft aren't shooting Brownings. They've got Gatling style machine guns that shoot very heavy bullets. Well, it wouldn't necessarily penetrate all points of the armor, especially the top and back. These bullets are gonna tear up a tank. So it's not that unrealistic to over time take out these tanks with strafing runs. At least I don't think it is, maybe. Maybe it is somewhat. But I think most elements of this game's damage make great sense. Pretty obvious way pretty obviously the way it should be. In terms of the mechanics for war games. I always felt the biggest thing lacking in this game was Navy before Red Dragon and is now you know, prefab structure and, and landmines, you know, pr prepared defense type things. You're not able to use any kind of engineer or sapper units to use the terrain to affect the battle. And I think uh, it's hard to implement clearly harder than Navy was to implement, but I hope that that's where the next war game goes. Gives the ability to create, you know, sandbag fortifications all the way up to heavily fortified, you know, a fortified FOB. Bring in your FOB and then have your engineers station nearby, fortify it up and man the defenses with all sorts of infantry so that any attack on your FO, you know, fort operating base can't just wipe it out with cannon fire like often happens in the multiplayer. A little distracted from my tangent, but that battle was going my way. Another case where sometimes better just to do damage to your enemy. With that map I knew that I didn't need the total victory so I was more focused on not taking a ton of losses and getting a lot of kills. In this case it paid off, able to destroy the unit and then with the capture of the province destroys the air unit stationed or assigned to the airfield. It's my first airfield and so I could theoretically assign aircraft there but personally I need more points. Infantry. We have Naval Supreme in the Sea of Japan, but there's a South Korean Naval Squadron casting off. Doesn't actually matter, although if you're playing the long game, your northern carrier can eventually drop its Marines and assault Nagasaki. So that's why that South Korean squadron is there game-wise, is to prevent you from easily doing that. However, in the speedrun challenge. We don't wait around to turn five or six. We can get all our ducks in a row to win the campaign. We're going for the earliest possible victory. Turn two or three is the goal. So here on turn one, we're trying to set up so that we could potentially win on turn two. And only a bad battle will cause us to win it on turn three. Taking a look at the forces, I'll face it to Tori. Decide that's where the fighter aircraft needs to be stationed. Rather than heading to Hiroshima, if I assigned it to Hiroshima this turn, it'd be unable to fight into Tori this turn. And this is all about 
maximizing my chances for an early turn two or three win. Second chopper unit, the one with infantry, heads to Kanoya, while the first chopper unit was moved into Gobo. Now with the Spetsnats in Nagasaki, every airfield but Totori has forces present and can be attacked because those forces present have at least one point of initiative. Thus leading my attack is infantry or airborne or helicopters. There are no tanks which have only two initiative. Smallest reinforcement, the five point recon, comes into an undefended sector and then moves into Kanoya. Since the helicopter also moved in, this should give me three sectors and or an encirclement in Kanoya. Because as you see, there is no blue arrow pointing out of Kanoya that its troops could use. Strategically and tactically, having that encirclement makes the battle much, much easier. If there weren't forces here in the central part of this island, I'd be able to do the same to Nagasaki with this airborne unit. But since it can't fight in Kumamoto and then move to Nagasaki, and it's all about maximizing my chances for the early win, I don't go for that risk of dividing my forces and hitting Nagasaki more strongly later. I hit Nagasaki as strongly as I can this turn. There's a glitch telling that I will get the top province, but actually I come in with the bottom province. Not sure why this particular glitch happens. But uh, it is a consistent one. Haven't been able to find a way to switch it where I get the proper northern province to start with. Given that and previous failures, my strategy has become to hold in the south while a force goes north to take the sector that I'm supposed to start with. saw the uh, tail end of the video, the twitch part of the video of the last unsuccessful attempt. Now let's see how to successfully attempt this mission. You can see by what I'm bringing in first, what hurt me the worst last time, and that is choppers. So my Shrek it machine gun AA APCs carrying their AA surface-to-air missile infantry come in first and then what infantry I can afford to hold the town and then everything else I might need but you can tell potentially that I'm building a force to go up this road that curves around and heads to the northern province, the northern sector. This is one of the hardest, if not the hardest battles in the entire campaign because you face a very, very balanced and potent force. <clears throat> Pardon my... <clears throat> Pardon my allergies, I'm okay. But yeah, they have a very varied and potent force, including the two things that deal out damage the quickest in this game, helicopters and tanks. They're good choppers and they're good tanks. Make it hard for my AA to simply clear their helicopters and then move on the assault, like would be my preferred tactic in this type of map to catch the enemy before their superior numbers can begin to tell. When you have more units and you haven't fought, unlike my Spetsnaz has, you have more cohesion, that's more command points per cycle, 
and thus you'll be overwhelmed in many of these battles if you're moving fast like I am. You'll be overwhelmed if you don't take the offensive. Staying on the defensive does make the micro much, much easier and might be the way to do it. But uh, with the way I play, I have found this to be the easier way as how I try to do it in this attempt. The most valuable units are probably the, I call them the Shrekets, maybe pronounced differently in reality. But they are the APC transports that you get for some of the best AA units. And when I'm building my own deck, I like to put anti-tank units in Shreket transports so that uh, I can send a single unit to an area and have both anti-tank guided missiles and a point defense AA capability. See, I almost get my uh, command infantry killed here by not remembering to position him inside the buildings. But uh, yeah, I was just I was just baiting those rockets out. It was all planned. The tow missiles do a lot of damage, but the Shrek it has just enough armor to survive that hit it takes. These OH-60, another one of the most annoying choppers, because even though they have no weapons, their size and stealth, sometimes even without great stealth, a small sized unit can be very hard to spot, and that is the case. Another thing is that shooting helps to reveal you, it makes you less stealthy. So when your recon chopper has no weapons, it's going to remain as stealthy as possible at all times. And I may have forgotten to mention, in addition to their great tanks and great choppers, they also have great artillery. So you can't just sit still in this mission. If you are on the defensive, you're at the very least going to have to shimmy around to avoid the targeted artillery fire that these recon choppers are going to be bringing in. Case in point, right there. Just lost a unit to a rocket artillery barrage, which is something we haven't seen too much in our campaigns. And as you see, is very inaccurate against a single target, but can bring a whole assault to its knees if it's targeted in the right sector at the right time. And it can be the perfect thing to soften up a group of buildings or a group of forests that contains the enemy and would otherwise really exact a toll in blood if you were to take it. However, what's good for the goose is good for the gander and my own recon chopper there. See my Shrek, it's not uh, not good at avoiding the fire, but at least manages to survive those missiles, but with one point. I think it's probably like a 50-50 chance if you survive, or maybe you definitely survive if it hits your front, but definitely not if it hits your side. I don't know how the game uh, quite calculates the guided missile versus armor damage at times. But I know that plenty of times you get caught with a helicopter Sackless type missile. You just go boom. The CV they're using is actually a tank or a, or a cannoned vehicle. And so it's very lucky that I brought some anti-tank infantry. Otherwise, this command vehicle might have taken me out by itself. It's 125 points, which is the value of very good tanks. But means that it was probably a command vehicle mounted inside about a 40 or 55 point ish tank chassis so luckily it wasn't a super heavy tank that dealt a lot of damage and a few rockets take it out and I'm in good position to at the very least neutralize the sector when a command unit unloads in an already occupied sector won't give you extra points if you control it, but it will neutralize it if it's the enemy who controls it. 
as I'm low on numbers, part of the infantry assault force here is recon, which are much worse to use on an assault because they have half of the manpower and I think also less ammo, less RPG and small arm ammo. But needing some infantry to garrison each of the sectors I do control, I'm forced to lean on the recon to give enough numbers to this assault to make it at least somewhat threatening. I decided the area by the bridge is too hot, but fortunately my APCs have amphibious capability, so I'm just heading right across the river. I'm going to hope they never even notice this command unit. In the meantime, it's an even fight here. It's anyone's guess at this point of recording as to who might win. Here in the present, I know. But I won't tell you. Except I already did tell you if you were paying attention. But maybe you weren't, so if that's the case, I'll keep the suspense. Dismounted uh, Factorias lagging behind probably hurt my chances in this battle. Dismounting and remounting is one of the more tough things to do. However, just as I arrive with my command unit, their command unit is spooked by the battle. Or perhaps was just seeking to reposition elsewhere. But because of that, I gain instantly instant control upon my arrival rather than neutralizing the sector and I can bring in reinforcements on this side which gives me a real chance of encircling the enemy however I run smack dab into all of his reinforcements luckily for me RPGs against APCs favors the infantry and I'm taking out their forces before they can kill me too badly Although one of the four infantry does get shot down by machine guns before I can clear the near the spawn area of enemy forces. This does give me an idea of where they're headed though. The enemy had a consistent stream of reinforcements heading for the central province. With this encirclement, I've cut off any future reinforcements they can bring in. However, the losses I've already taken might well prevent a total victory, and so I'm going to need to try to drive the enemy to retreat, or find and destroy that last command unit. Their tank assault goes in supported by rocket artillery, and that means that without support, this forest area is almost certain to fall. The Patur Factorias, my guided missile anti-tank infantry, are moving into position to try to catch those tanks, but it's honestly not looking good. On the other side, infantry re reinforcements are just what the doctor ordered to clear these anti-tank infantry, though the APCs that brought them in might have a bad time of it. They have at least got a chance of taking them out. The machine gun fire will make the guided missiles considerably less accurate as they must maintain that lock. And uh, in case you're aware, somewhat harder to point your laser targeting apparatus at something when it's shooting machine guns at you. This has been scientifically proven. My choice of reinforcements to go to reinforce the Spetsnats we've already seen fighting was an AA unit. I brought in the Shrekets first because their direct fire can also target infantry and to a lesser extent APCs but now having exhausted all infantry and other AA I'm 
bringing in vehicular AA or attract AA vehicles to make sure that I can have extra resources to take out their next helicopter attack. However, with a good spacing of my SAM infantry, it seems like I've taken out most of the choppers except for some of these isolated recon choppers, which are much better at both evading the missiles and at identifying the range at which they can stay safe once they identify a target they seem to stay at the edge of SAM range so that you'd have to move into the open with your missiles to attack them the clearing of the forest on this bluff is going well from here I can help secure both ways that enter this sector and prevent them from recapturing it. I expect a counterattack to come in soon because the enemy relentlessly attacks. That's why I've been stuck on very slow this whole mission so far, this whole battle so far. Something that I do try to avoid so that the videos and or stream doesn't drag but on these toughest of missions in a speed run you have to slow down the timer to minimize your losses instantly react to planes and tanks before they can get into a position that will gut you <laughs> and so encircling this force definitely looks like we've found another instance <clears throat> Another instance of grabbing the tiger by its tail. I've cut off their reinforcements, but they definitely had plenty of tanks, really plenty of everything massed up in that center sector before I managed to do so. At least I completely hold this northern sector, although I expect a counterattack to come in in this direction from the center. Now that they know where I am, they've sent attacks to the center and the south, and are continuously attacking. But I expect that uh, they will send reinforcements, and there's something headed to the north command vehicle plus potentially some recon or APCs turns out that at least the first group and probably the second group coming down that road are APCs which means that they have dispatched their rapid response force to the north to try to retake it so I brace with everything I have to try to defend but I don't have much more than is already present so my main ability to reinforce it is by getting supplies to the troops reinforcing their strength and repairing any damage they've taken As I mentioned, this is one of the harder battles, and you can see the rough ratio of forces on the right as the command bars start as a percentage of your total forces modified by your morale as to how many command points you require. You will uh, have to expand in battle before you're routed or suffer a defeat of some kind. I've just managed to get some troops into the buildings and so do manage to defeat this first force headed to the north. But it was more of a scouting force. If they attack with anything stronger, it's going to be tough to hold. In 
the south. Another attack led by the APCs is coming in. They've either already unloaded their infantry or they're trying to get into a position beneficial and out of the open where they can unload them. I now realize the enemy is attacking the north at two angles, coming back the way that he originally came from towards the spawn point or the reinforcement point here in the map. They've also managed to reload and retarget that rocket artillery, which is capable of killing vast numbers of infantry and destroying lighter vehicles. I'm lucky that their APCs aren't heavily armed, so my APC is winning this fight. At least the AA-1 especially has higher firepower than their standard APC, the Shiki. The Nana San Shiki. Fortunately, their armor isn't so strong that my standard APC can't damage. Eventually, the machine guns of my APC will wear down their armor if that's all they're bringing. So I'm managing to withstand north and south, although I'm taking losses everywhere. And I've probably already lost the total victory. I still want some form of total victory, even if it's just destroying all of my enemy forces. I'd like the airfield this turn. Don't want to drag this battle out. normal speed. You can imagine this battle would have been very difficult to manage with tanks, helicopters, APCs, and artillery happening almost simultaneously. It's a lot to fight against. And their tanks prevent your AA from getting close to kill the helicopter recon, which will identify you and correct for the artillery strikes that come in. It's a very hard combined force to face. Most of my play tests went through with just some missions needing to be retried, but this particular campaign had a failure where I had to completely restart the campaign because of this sector. If you don't bring enough AA forces, the helicopters will chase you out of this sector all by themselves. So I had to swap out the counter tank Vetived for the counter air Vetived. There's a 10 and 20 point version of each. And in this setup, you can only afford the 10 point versions. This gives you the two helicopter units, which are pretty much of capable of taking sectors by themselves. You can see that those uh, empty APCs earlier had unloaded their infantry and they're now trickling in piecemeal but certain types of anti-tank. These Hans have rockets that are actually pretty dangerous to infantry as well. So I have to be careful engaging them so I don't take too many hits from those rockets. Keeping my forces in the buildings and the tree lines helps keep them from identifying me until they're taking fire, at which point they're likely to be stunned before they can get their shot off. It 
So, so far, the, this is the fourth campaign. So far, through these campaigns, my tactics have generally either been to assault all out, to defend all out, or to assault to capture a certain part of the map and then defend. Here we managed to find all of the command units. It looks like they evacuated the center command unit, tried to get to the periphery to get some more reinforcements, but they didn't quite make it. Luckily for me, because I had suffered almost 50% casualties, far more than 30%, they could have gotten me the total victory otherwise. So, yep, it's a beautiful day. The probably hardest mission is beaten, and we can now deploy the 3rd Guards Tank Division. Fortunately, I didn't, uh, didn't save any points for them. It's such an important map to have beaten. We get, we get the save in. That's two airports down, two under our control. And now that the Airborne has had its day, it's time for the Marines to show their worth. This is a naval regiment, which means it has ships and amphibious command vehicles which can be deployed in that naval sector. Because of the direction of Osaka, I can pincer attack this map, bringing in my ground tanks. These are part of the naval regiment. My tanks that came from Osaka captured this sector, but don't have the initiative to actually participate. Those, I believe, are T-72s, so instead we're utilizing these naval T-55s, which have also had anti-tank missiles added to them that have longer range than their cannons and a bit more damage as well. So be it There'll be a naval group and the reinforcements attacking from this naval sector. And then there'll be an armored formation. The non-naval T-55s in my starting deck positioned in land province without a command unit so they won't be able to be reinforced. While the naval, sec naval sector will have the Najin cruiser present, cruiser or destroyer, not quite sure there, but it will allow it to bring in the reinforcements, and there are plenty of naval reinforcements. These tanks are about as good as the enemy tanks, so I attack head-on with one of the formations while moving the other across the river so that it can potentially engage in some flanking fire if I get stopped by enemy tanks that line up to fight them head to head. To head. Bring in one of the naval tanks here on the left and then set up the Nanushka vessels in the shallow water. They have a shallower draft than the Najin and can get their cannons in firing range of the enemy forces in that sector. So I'm moving a command unit in to get some land reinforcements, bringing in the naval reinforcements, and pressing with eight tanks and a couple recon on the right. You can see that the naval cannons are doing a good job, but that size of vessel is quite vulnerable to tanks, so I'm wary of pressing all the way to the shore. I want to be able to pull back to the deep sea if I get hit by a lot of tanks at the same time. In the meantime, while there's a recon moving to the right, it seems for the most part that they're holding their ground in the center and moving to reinforce and attack on the left. This puts my Nanushkas, which cost 120, about twice as much as the tanks that I have. This puts them in danger. And if I lose a bunch of them, I'm putting my total victory at risk. So I'm paying careful attention and I'm ready to pull them back if they start taking damage. 
Nanushkas have great damage output, but they can't take very much punishment. They are hit by cannon fire, AT missiles, or especially anti-ship missiles. They're likely to go down in under a minute. That sound means I'm taking damage somewhere. Looks like my ships and my tanks are taking hits. There are Shiki Cs facing my T-55s, which just got one of those T-55s. It looks like I've got the numbers. It's actually 7-on-7, seven seven, or 6-on-7 six with that kill there. So it's a pretty even fight. In this game, you want to avoid even fights. You want to attack with, hopefully, the superiority of numbers. And if you can't get superiority of numbers, at least get the superiority of position where you're attacking from outside their range or from at least one flank or attacking while they're stunned with artillery. Find some kind of advantage. My tanks at 55-60 uh, point of value are better than those C's, so I am able to just leave them to their own devices. I would have brought help if I could, but there just weren't any reinforcing options over there to the right. I'm bringing in naval tanks to assault the center and hopefully eventually relieve pressure on the right. But I can't directly support those tanks yet. In the meantime, looks like there's still a strong force in the center, so I lay down smoke giving my single tank on the left that's already been deployed a chance to get in close. I also find infantry here in the center, which checks my advance, and I reverse the tanks. If I were to move, it would expose my rear potentially to RPGs, so I reverse my tanks into the woods and out of RPG range. Although without any recon, that means I can't continue to fire at that infantry. I have to bring up some sort of unit to spot, or I have to bring that tank into RPG range itself to spot that infantry again. The Nanushka are blocked by the bridge, but Schmel and naval transports can make it into this river, and so that's one of the spotting units I'll choose to use as they are both expendable. The Schmel's at 50 points, not nearly as expendable, but still far more expendable than any of my other ships, aside from the landing vessels, the naval transports, I call them. My tank lucks out, catching some fairly rookie infantry. This is not an elite, one of the Japanese elite infantry units. And so fighting them and the Shiki A's, I actually have a chance in the smoke as I outclass both of those units with these medium tanks. Shiki A's are definitely a light tank at 35 points. Still formidable, and especially if they're flanking you, they can take out your medium tanks. So don't take them too lightly. Generally, they are the priority when you see them and you have tanks in the area. I identify a command vehicle, but I don't have much in range of it yet. So I try to organize the tanks on the right to attack in such a way that the command vehicle cannot escape to the south, but will be caught on one side or the other. One of the a T-55s on the south goes down, so I'm doing my best to call in reinforcements, bring in more of the naval tanks. In the meantime, the command points are looking good. I haven't taken too many losses, although the fact that they have been fairly expensive tanks means that the total victory is in jeopardy. 
and I have to be very careful pressing forward to not take more losses. Machine guns on my naval transports are able to take out that unarmed recon unit, helping the tanks not reveal themselves and continue on quickly. Looks like I nabbed that command vehicle. However, there's still some forces left in the center sector. My recon unit comes in range and almost takes an RPG, but manages to identify that infantry so that my tanks can stay out of range of it. Ironically, the infantry more dangerous to my three tanks than those two anti-tank infantry because the Hans direct fire rockets a little more versatile, a little less good against medium and heavy tanks compared to RPGs which have shorter range, but especially the guided missiles which will have longer range and a lot more armor penetration power. doing my best to avoid the infantry up north, which seems to be the last vestige there. I'm bypassing and heading south and hoping to get the last command vehicle and thus not have to worry about my own losses, my own loss total going over the limit at all. I catch one command vehicle there, but spot another in retreat. The enemy had a backup or they had one headed north that I have chased off with my attack. The Shiki A's are dangerous from the flanks, but unlikely to kill any of my tanks from the front, unless they were already very heavily damaged. So at this point, I'm comfortable speeding up and just A moving this final corner of the map. This infantry gets in the way and I'm worried. I want to kill the command unit, make sure I get that total victory, not to mention the higher point total. But in fact, you see it's just exceeded their sustainable losses rather than destroyed the last command vehicle. So they did have one sneaky command vehicle that made it to the side to hide somewhere. With Obama completely cleared, it sets up for the double move of the second Marines, this Naval Infantry Regiment. They have less tanks, and so they were chosen to go second. They will receive some air support to help make up for that lack of combat power. The other change is that they have the anti-tank style guided missiles in one of their infantry groups, and this will help greatly. They'll help compensate for the loss of number of tanks in this marine unit compared to its compatriot. And so after this, we will control three airfields and we'll have a technical victory, but we want a technical knockout. We want the opponent out of the map and surrendering completely. We don't want to run out the clock. This is the speedrun challenge. I also sometimes call it the blitz challenge because it's not really about speedrunning it fast in terms of ticks of the clock. Although that's nice and I'm certainly not trying to go slow. But it's about taking the fewest number of days in the campaign and defeating the enemy on day two or day three or day four of the war, which I'm told is desirable but never actually seems to happen in reality. My T-55 AMVs are still the better tank although they will face nearly equivalent tanks. But they'll be my point man here. 
and along with the infantry shooting their anti-tank missiles will create a barrage at these 15 point vehicles and the APCs they're escorting. That 50 point hit was an artillery piece, not a uh, vehicle or tank, but these ET Shikis are 15 point vehicles, essentially the equivalent of my ASU quasi tank vehicle. Excellent for uh, distracting the enemy, diverting their target away from more valuable units, but they themselves don't have much combat power. And in under a minute, that whole force is wiped out, and we spot the recon that was directing their AA fire. One of the weaknesses of this formation is that they don't have any AA, which is why they have the fighters present, but the 140 point fighters, while excellent, are hard to bring in early without compromising your land force. So, as of yet, we haven't brought any in, and we're just hoping to avoid the airstrikes rather than shoot them down. Needing the planes is one reason why we have a second command unit that captures this second sector so quickly so we can increase our income and begin to do better on these hard battles. I'm occasionally saving during the battle so I don't have to do all the setup again. This one in particular, maybe not on this playthrough but on one of the playthroughs I was getting absolutely hammered by their tanks and the way they attack in column and in numbers and because of the terrain of this map they're often coming out of the woods at point-blank range for instance near that mountain which has woods on each side of the road it's one of the directions that they usually attack from and the only way you can defend is to stay all the way back in the buildings and kill them in the open but that prevents your advance and we're looking for a total victory we don't want to draw this battle out just like every victory that uh, either is at an objective or gets us closer to an objective we want our total victory we want to drive the enemy into the sea or to surrender or to complete annihilation. We've seen all of those in the campaign so far. Not sure what we'll see here. But just know that this is the biggest obstacle left in this campaign. These other two battles with the helicopters will be much, much easier. As I mentioned earlier, I try to fight these hardest battles first, less hard afterwards. In this case though, this is a harder battle than the last battle, but that last battle unlocked the way to this airport sector, so it had to be fought in this order. We fought three airborne actions, one to get to the airport, then two to take airports. Now we've fought two naval actions, one to get to this airport, now we're conquering this airport. That'll give us three, and then we've got two helicopter forces that are at the two remaining airports and could potentially capture them this turn. We've put ourselves in position to win if we get those total victories. I position my tanks in such a way where they can move forward some but won't get ambushed the way I had mentioned they had been getting. They'll be covered on the left or the right by the anti-tank troops. I switched to very fast, trying to build up enough forces to get moving again. These infantry are pretty much stuck here guarding against counterattacks, 
but the lane to the south is mostly open and if I can move along it without without uh, encouraging them to attack that moving column but rather continuing on into my defenders which will continue eliminating them one column at a time I might have a chance in this battle finally got a pair of yaks that can take turns covering the land forces and hopefully prevent their napalm from getting any kills the napalm bombers often do the most damage in this fight after that the most likely is the tanks but they do have decent infantry and several areas where they garrison them that will also take a toll on your forces. You see when they spot my planes the enemy evacs but my missiles are so long range that sometimes that's not good enough. Here, here a missile connects but doesn't do enough damage to finish off that napalm bomber. And so the buildup continues. We both start with a fair amount of command points, but the enemy is much stronger having multiple battle groups. I only have one battle group supported by air, and that is fighter cover, not bombers. Fighter cover is very necessary against napalm because that napalm is a severe danger to infantry and vehicles. It kills vehicles more slowly but it has a good chance of stunning them and a stunned vehicle stuck in napalm will die slower but it will still usually die since my fighters are having a little trouble closing in with the enemy forces I bring in the only two SAMs I've got the SAMs can go forward with the attack on the left and hopefully we'll shoot down any bombers before they can get to me. They've sussed out my tanks and they're coming at them trying to destroy them. As I only have four, my strategy is to fight as hard as I can with them, do as much damage as I can with them, and any time they take a significant amount of damage themselves, pull back to the FOB, the forward operating base, and get some repairs in. Beside that I might have a chance to cut off their reinforcements by sending a command unit with the attack. So as my southern attack goes in, I call in a command unit as reinforcement. The infantry in my second sector is being left behind to defend. All further reinforcements will join the attack. As you can see, the mobility of a marine battle group is a little bit limited in a land province where they can't deploy with their naval transports. My APC usage in this game is not great. I'm a lot better with tank and chopper maneuvers and navy than I am with APCs and, for the most part, infantry as well. My infantry tactics basically consist of unloading in a town, waiting until that town is not being attacked anymore, and loading back up and moving to the next town. But uh, don't underestimate those infantry tactics because that pretty much will win you most of the battles, as infantry are very tanky, pretty affordable, and unless 
you've got the wrong specialty also usually do pretty good damage too. For instance, an AA is not going to do anything to a tank and vice versa. But uh, other than that, the infantry are usually the most cost-effective option. I see that my southern tank is being threatened by a brigade of four enemy tanks that are heading south. They've tried everything to dislodge my two remaining tanks, my two surviving tanks. And now it looks like they're circling around from the other side. But I've re-ammoed that Petur Factoria, and so the 40 point, the armor of a 40 point tank is not quite good enough. They'll die in one or two hits, depending on the location. Although as they move, they do have a reasonable chance of dodging, especially if they're moving into cover or further out of range. Once they've moved out of range, a hit actually becomes impossible. But it seems that the accuracy shifts. If you target them at a point where, say, you had 50% accuracy and then they start moving away, the actual accuracy of your guided missile will come at the point of contact. If uh, it arrives at a point where you've had 25% accuracy, you'll only have a 1 in 4 chance of actually hitting even though you fired when it said 50%. The disadvantage between the guided missiles versus certain other types of projectiles your infantry can launch. My T-55 takes a direct hit there but survives. Fortunately, its armor a bit better comparatively than the cannon it was facing. Sounds the phone there, sorry. So with Yaks pushing forward and covering the advance and those tanks now dealt with. The southern attack goes in, but it doesn't have much time. 20 minutes is the maximum you get on any of these campaign battles, and I'm just now getting to the six minute remaining mark. The bright side is that I've destroyed a large number of my opponent's good tanks. Doesn't seem like all of them, though. They start this mission with a large, large number of mediocre vehicle tanks and a medium number of good and okay actual tanks. Their bombers stumble right into the path of three interceptors, and so I get the kill there on two bombers. They drop their napalm, but it was more of a panic drop, and it misses the target. I'm now achieving air superiority, and I haven't taken any SAM fire. So as I probably could have checked before, and may have. It seems like this enemy is light on SAMs, they're light on AA. I decide of the two provinces I could attack to head to the furthest back one as infantry in those buildings would shred anything approaching from the south or from the river. That sector of Anna is really a mini fortress and if I can bypass it and deal enough damage at home to cause them to retreat I might just get the victory that way despite suffering more than 30 percent losses and not getting a technical total victory point-wise. I'm staying out of the medium anti-tank range of the town, as I know the Hans have about a mile and a half. Those units I have are staying about or two, two kilometers rather than one and a half kilometers, the range of their Han anti-tank infantry.
if very unlucky there, and catch artillery on my forces trying to avoid them. But on the bright side, it looks like the southern attack has found their weak spot. Infantry in Anna, tanks in Elena, but nothing but artillery, command units, and a fob, and this recon here in their peripheral sector. Driving away the command unit gets me control of it and instant reinforcements. I only have one infantry right now to protect my command unit though, so I am rushing as fast as possible. Here I luck out and get 200 points of artillery and a command unit right here at the reinforcement point. Nothing there that can really deal with my infantry. And suddenly I've encircled this enemy force. Just encircling doesn't guarantee you a total victory though. I really have to keep doing damage. I have to find more command units if possible. If not possible, I have to do enough damage to each unit to get that total victory. Yep, this third airport's stressing me out. Quite worried that with less than two minutes, that I can't get either the point total or the final command vehicle. Situations like this, you'll see me go to moving fast, which can be tactically unwise in these situations. Oof. Hark, what's that? It's a command unit. My Fatoria chooses a bad target, but I manually retarget onto the command vehicle. The rocket flies. And was that it? Could it be? It was the last command vehicle. Our total victory saved with just a minute or so left. A very, very beautiful sight. We might have actually had the points to get the total victory, but that's beautiful. See, you're controlling three airfields. This is necessary to ensure victory, but surely you're doing a challenge where you're trying to get five, so carry on. Thank you, Commander. We go ahead and we make it official, saving our third airport, and now we move on to Gobo. This area is dangerous because it contains the 160 point Abrams type super tank. But in in the war, in the war, in modern warfare, if rock beats scissors, then uh, helicopters are rock and tanks are scissors. And the one thing they forgot to bring along with their tanks was any kind of AA support or infantry. And uh, that's a bad idea. And I think we're about to see why that's a bad idea. When it comes to choppers, I like to split them all into singular units and then use that drag feature where you click then drag the mouse and your units will enter a formation, a line, along the line that you drag. It's especially useful for helicopters, which can have a mechanic where they will not fire while moving because they're tilted and their cannons will only, cannons and or rockets and or missiles will only fire when level. There's the first 170 point tank killed. There's another 170 point tank killed. As you can see, you can pretty much just kill the tanks, kill all the tanks and win this battle by the points. 
10 of those tanks is 1,700 bloody points. But as I was saying, one of the important bits of micro in this battle, you don't see me do much micro, but there are some necessary bits, is turning off the weapons, and I don't turn all of them off. I only hold fire the Saklos missiles, and that's by clicking them. You can turn that weapon type red and reserve the ammo. The one thing that could probably cost me this map is running out of anti-tank missiles before they run out of those 170 point tanks. So you want to make sure not to waste them all in mass volley fire. You want to be firing four to five at a time so that you can be sure to achieve two or three hits per volley. But two or three hits is usually enough for the kill. Beyond that, you're usually doing a lot of overkill damage, which equates to a lot of wasted supply. The choppers move back to the forward operating base and begin to land and recover supply. I could have and probably should have chosen a more wide open area for this fob, but being positioned next to the forest allows me to put some of the infantry I bought, brought along in that forest to protect it in case the battle got dicey and I need something to cover for the choppers while they resupply. Here, however, I wiped out their first column of tanks and so I'm still bringing in more helicopters rather than bringing in any infantry to man that forest. I am a bit worried about the enemy circling around, so I begin to bring in recon units. You can tell by the binoculars which of the units is recon or not. Generally, you want three recons in any sector, one in the center and as kind of a reserve, and then one off to each side. If you're advancing, that's your left flank, your right flank, and your forward recon. So I'm feeling pretty confident now that my flanks are secure, and I've rearmed most of my choppers, so it's time to move forward. Another attack wave. One of the reasons to choose this helicopter unit as opposed to the other is because it gets better support. It gets better logistical helicopters. And while the fob that was brought in by the infantry moving out of Obama is very helpful, you can run out of time on this map as they have so many forces to defeat. So to save time, you bring in the logistic choppers further forward than the FOB is and resupply your more crucial helicopters via helicopter. So you can see taking out three or four of their super heavy tanks can almost exhaust all of my rocket and any tank missile ammo by itself. So far, however, nothing's been shot down, at least nothing I've noticed. So I keep pressing the attack, even though ammo is low, I know that I'm chewing through the vehicles, and for the most part, the infantry will be taken out with just the cannon fire, that's the heavy machine guns that these most of these helicopters mount. But every helicopter I've brought in has some sort of machine gun. And they are pretty much the equivalent of what a Super Cobra type chopper would use. They chew through infantry and at close range can destroy even armored vehicles. 
That's why I'm moving to the sides of these heavy tanks. From the front, my machine gun's range is a few dozen meters, maybe. From the sides, suddenly my helicopter can attack from more like three or four hundred meters and actually damage these heavy tanks. So even without my Saklos anti-tank ammo, I'm still moving to attack with rockets to stun and machine gun fire hoping to penetrate the side and rear armor. At this point, I don't want to send any of my choppers back. I just want to rearm by bringing choppers forward. The A move has now divided my choppers. I've got some that have made it all the way to Dimitri and are either out of ammo or only using their machine guns at this point. Despite starting way behind, we're now way in the lead. Our command point bar is on the right, getting to the point where we could get the total victory if we stay on this course, continue to not take any losses. The briefing mentioned how strong Gobo was, so a total victory here would be beautiful and would give us a legitimate chance to win this turn. Deciding just to uh, bypass and continue the attack. I have the chopper logistics ready now that the fob is emptied. Like I said, one of the few ways I could lose is by running out of ammo. You can see that I'm already down to machine gun ammo and only the logistics of my choppers to refill them. So I'm choosing the best and most veteran choppers to go back and be re-ammoed. And anyone who still has any ammo left at all is kept at the front. This final attack will decide if I can do it without taking any or many losses, I get the total victory. But my forces have very low ammo. There's a missile symbol for if you're out of the Saklos missiles. And then the other ammo represents your rockets. If they completely cease firing, then they're also out of the machine gun ammo. But as that has a short range, in most cases, most of the choppers don't even get in range to fire that machine gun ammo. Some of their heavy tanks show up here at the end. And I see that if I can get one or two of them, the battle's over. But their machine guns are pretty strong, as you see here. They're damaging the 24 VP, which is one of my best and most expensive choppers that I can bring in. So I head back and do my best to rearm and prepare for another strike. Take out these tanks before they can find a target. you got to be careful because your helicopters, if you don't give them orders, will eventually land and then they can actually be shot at by tank cannons as long as they're in the air they cannot be targeted by the tank's cannon that final tank gets it for me and you see here that we did take some losses but for the most part it was a flawless victory our helicopters, well supplied with missiles, just steamrolled their AA list force. One chopper lost. Didn't even see it go down, but it did go down to those tanks' machine guns. Yep, he was the unlucky one. They'll expect one of us in the wreckage, brothers. With his fourth airport victory, is at hand, comrade? 
bring us a fifth airport on the plate. I can promise you an appointment in the Kremlin. I do have an appointment with the Kremlin, but it's to take the place over. I'm not going to be, get a medal pinned on me. But anyway, the final airport, Kanoya, has three battalions or two battalions and a regiment defending it. I bring an airborne regiment and a small company of recon in a pincer attack that has cut them off from any reinforcements. By mining the two roads leading out of Kanoya, they're cut off. Cut off and encircled. I did indeed manage to capture three sectors, which puts them in a rough position, but also me in a rough position. Only two of them, fortunately, can bring in reinforcements, but I must defend each of those two to keep him from bringing in reinforcements, and there's really no way as far apart as they are, my two defensive forces can support each other. So he's probably going to assault in one direction, whereas I'm going to have to defend two directions. Still, I'd rather have that advantage than let him bring in his overwhelming reserves and eventually wear me down, as you can see by the bars on the right. If all our forces were called in, he'd have a lot more than I would. So the strategy is to hold with the infantry scout and attack with the choppers assuming they're not required to defend an assault on one of these sectors that I must hold. The two sectors that I have the command units in are the only two sectors that can bring in reinforcements and I'm under attack already. The enemy also had helicopters and so while no Land-based troops could have reached anywhere near me by now. Their choppers are already right on top of me. Luckily, I've got my troops in the trees, or they'd already be going down. These AH, AH-1Ss are the enemy's strong choppers. Everything else doesn't have a machine gun. So it was three on five. And those three did manage to take one of my attack choppers down. These attack choppers aren't as potent because they're also transports. But they are very combat effective compared to Huey type choppers, which don't have anything but their machine guns. These choppers in most cases have either rockets or missiles or both in addition to their machine guns. And so are putting out a lot of combat power, especially if they're dropping infantry as well. In this case, I'm not risking my infantry inside my choppers. I don't want to take the hit if they all die. Assuming I can't find all the command units, I need to keep my losses very low so that I get the total victory. However, in this situation where you start encircled, you have a much better chance of finding all their command units. I see that there's one in Boris and one in this other sector to the south of it. As is often the case, it's totally isolated and has no support. The AI is better about supporting its command units when it's able to bring in reinforcements. When it can't bring in reinforcements, it's much more likely to assault with everything it has to try to gain a reinforcement point, and it will leave one or more command units behind, all but undefended. After knocking out their helicopters, and one command unit. Seems like this may be the last of their forces. They might have had something significant there, but a lucky first shot takes out their second and last command unit, giving me a total victory at the fifth airport on turn one or day two. And so could it be... Could it be possible that 
a total victory on this gives me the victory. Excellent. These five airports, Japan will be a communist country before the war's out. This is a total victory, and I must admit I am impressed. The Americans are withdrawing in a hurry. They never showed up. And the Japanese are begging us for an armistice. Well done, comrade. The Secretary General is keen to meet you in person. I'll bring my knife. Well, folks, we've, we've reached the end. Success in the fourth campaign. Here in our fourth episode, I hope you enjoyed the spicy Russian tactics we brought. Certainly a bit more effective here in the game than the Russians are in real life, thankfully. That's all I have for you. I really hope you enjoyed. This is the longest video I've ever commentated, and it uh, it's not easy. Mad respect to all of you announcers out there who manage it on the daily. I hope you guys tune in here at the YouTube or check me out at Twitch. Have a great day, and I'll see you all around.